Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20-plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, where I bring you the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your own inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Today on the podcast, we have not one, but two special guests that are changing the world of live performance, music, and meta music, metaverse, as we currently know it. First, Nick Holmson is with us as CEO and co-founder of TSX Entertainment, and he comes from the likes of a little company called Spotify, where he served as VP, Global Head of Music. And prior to that, he founded multiple companies in music advertising and playlisting, one of which was acquired and ultimately we brought him to Spotify. And Scott Keeney, a.k.a. DJ Ski, is a true hip-hop veteran who has hustled his way into the upper echelon of executive boards, both on his own platforms like Dash Radio and Ski TV, as well as a chief metaverse officer more recently alongside Nick at TSX Enterprises. And we got a lot more to talk about than titles and accolades so let me stop talking for a minute and welcome to our guest ski and nick we did it welcome to the podcast what's up adam great to be here man thanks for having us <laughs> nick, uh, scott how you doing guys and and we we got here a little bit of technical difficulties but i think we we worked through it here so let's start off let's start off with a little love story tell us a love story of nick and ski how did you guys meet? where did the, where did the spark where did all the magic begin I think you said it that I mean I think the first time I met you wasn't that outside of Spotify office in and Sunset is that the first time we met or just yeah, trying to remember. I think we, we go to, like, yeah I think so I think it was actually that's right that's I forgot about it yeah that was we got connected through the guy who was uh, then like COO then at the time he's like talked to my guy Nick he's the guy that really runs everything on the content side I was launching or just launched Dash at the time um, our, our radio platform and we, we instantly just clicked I think right yeah I mean I remember it because it was pretty spectacular <laughs> and by um, ski at that time as well because I, I think we had our office at sunset at that time at spotify and and i remember ski was saying like yeah i'm coming up you know like i because we trying to get these meetings in the books and he was uh, I, I was probably always busy and he said like yeah but let me know where you're heading for your next meeting and i come by with my sprinter and we take the meeting in the car when i take you to the next meeting i think that was the first introduction and yeah. i was like came down and had this beautiful sprinter, you know, like with his seats and video screens and all the entertainment you can imagine that. Right. And that, that I think it was the first time we met. And then we had like a 45 minute ride and, and that's what we got in Quinn. So yeah. And the rest is history. Then we ended up hanging out over in Stockholm and connecting at different conferences and things over the years. And, you know, we'd always been trying to figure out a way to work together. And this was, uh, I think the, the, the perfect opportunity given both of our backgrounds and interests. The world I love it. Sometimes. And, and I love packing professional, professional relationships. Where do you guys think of that yin and yang kind of complementary skill sets? Where, where do you think those two powerhouse sides are that really make you guys a dynamic duo? I'll let you go first, Guy. Yeah, I think, I mean, like both of us are content people at the core, right? Like we're both musicians. Nick is a, a musician. I'm a, I'm a DJ, right? Like, and, and so we understand the culture. And I think that's the, you know, one of the biggest challenges. And we're both like natural entrepreneurs, right? Like even though music was our career, we've been successful more, you know, off of the, the stage from that. And, and always we're forward thinking. Nick obviously selling his company to Spotify, me always being in tech and, and into new media. Um, so I think we always like one, shared similar interests in alignment. But I think, you know, also the, those backgrounds 
backgrounds and upbringings and experiences were, were different. Whereas, you know, Nick had sold his company and went to work at, you know, the biggest, you know, music streaming platform in the world that changed the, the way the industry was. I was on the other side, like, right, like hosting radio shows, hosting TV shows and launching my own startup and doing it kind of independently and, and venturing very, you know, heavily into Web3 and, and, and more advanced things where he had this this great backing and like inside look of being on a rocket ship with Spotify from, you know, even though he got acquired by them, they were still small when he was acquired. So he was basically like within that startup. So I think like the merging of all those experiences was, you know, just, you know, the perfect, you know, it's created the perfect combination. In my perfect. Eyes. Right, right time and right place. But let's hit the rewind button for, for a quick second here. And Scott, I know that your parents are both, both musicians and you started DJing early on. Why, why do you think you gravitated more towards the, the technical electronic side versus an instrument or, or singing or actually rapping? Is that, is that a skill set perspective, a passion? Where does that you come from? Hear me sing. You don't want to hear me sing as much as I think I might be able to sing or, or rap, right? Like it's just horrific. Not, we, some of us have talent, some of us don't. So I was like, but I always loved like music and sequencing, even when I was a kid and had like a CD changer, right? I'd like sequence the way songs were played and stuff. So when I actually got behind turntables, I was like, oh, this is my destiny. This is what I'm going to do. It's it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of crazy how how that works. And um, Nick, um, there might be people who who don't much really know about you, uh, you know, creating you know music, and but you do have impressive writing credits, right? Yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of interesting stories, you know, like being especially growing up in Sweden, and I think the reason uh, that Scott and I just to 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 add something to his story is also that I think like my way has always been we will I think we creators at heart I think we understand that the entertainment industry is really based on creators and talents, and I think we always we have the same uh, you know approach where we believe that new technology is just gonna you know, make these more like a um, even playing field, meaning like gatekeepers disappears when new technology comes. And I think that has been, our understanding has always been around the fact that we, we core, by core, we know what it means to be a creator. And we're trying, you know, to be more educated than maybe our peers that are creators and helping them navigate that environment. And I think for me, my big wake up call was that I, I spent a few years, you know, working with Simon Cowell's writing and producing, you know, in the early days, just when he started Idol. And I, and I, he made a lot of really heavy, made some really impact to my way of thinking. He always said, you know, which I still believe it's like, it's all about that 22 year old nurse working at the hospital in the suburb to London. When you get her, you have got everyone, you know, like your aim was always that. The other thing he also said, which always was, was like an interesting way because I felt it was like a privilege just to get into the doors of Simon Cowell at the time when basically everyone was trying to write songs and, and, and get credits and, and, and get success is that he said like from his position, he felt like, we're going to change the world by launching Idol. And suddenly we don't need to go down there and suck up for these DJs at BBC to play our records. And I think like for me, it's always been about that innovation of trying to like take that step to replace gatekeepers. And I think when I'm looking at the entertainment industry right now, like how easy and how cheap it is to produce stuff and if you're really talented and if you're a hustler, there's enough tools out there to really succeed uh, to that point. So, I mean, like I, I had the privilege to work with a lot of larger artists and writing tracks at that time. But that was more like something I brought with me into this new environment and, and to better understand like what it takes. And, and I think the most fantastic thing about where we are right now is that the competition is brutal, but it's open for everyone. I think that's a game changer. And and that's and that's a beauty. And it's a great segue into Web3. I mean, I have a million notes here where I could go way back into, into your backgrounds. I mean, Ski, we could talk offline. I want to hear about your 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 writing to Steve Rifkin and we could we could park that one over there. I think it's a, a good follow-up story. And but let's talk about Web3 for a minute here. Let's talk about Web3. And from my perspective here as a student of the game of Web3, it's changing the game as far as in, in, inclusiveness. And I think the big point you hit on before, Nick, is education. And that's another huge component because, A, it is the hurdle that's in front of us right now. We have to educate. There's, I call it like my mom factor or the like lowest common that like we need to educate. Like I need my mom to understand to a certain degree what the hell Web3 is, right? Because if I need her to adopt to it, then it's going to be mass adoption. And but there's elements of 
gatekeeping, I, I see in a negative way in the Web3 world. And also I see negative ways of being like too exclusive with some of these. I mean, you have, you have freaking uh, Tiffany and, and, and co like dropping, you know, uh, limited NFTs. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts, uh, gents, on how are we going to bring Web3 to the masses? I think that, you know, that's one interesting challenge that we're taking head on at TSX. You know, I'm huge. I think we're all huge proponent, proponents of, of Web3 in the future and technology. But yes, you know, the, especially when you look at what's happened over the last, you know, even year with like the, the NFT scene in those communities, it is very exclusive. And even if you look at that, it's, it becomes very insular. Like one of the challenges that I think, you know, was not helping the market is the fact that, you know, white lists on new projects were always going to pre people that were owners of other projects. So it's like the rich getting richer, right? Like if you have one, then you're allowed to get this because they want to be in the wallet of somebody that owns a board eight. And then like that, that exclusivity. And then the prices started like excluding the average people out. And it just became like for all the transactions and all the volume, it's still a relatively small amount of people that are actually active participating. And then it's also created like a backlash, like, NFT, Web3, a lot of these things have become like dirty words, even metaverse to some extent, is they've just become like buzzwords and overused by corporations and people that are, that are in there on it. We think that the technologies and the underlying concepts of them are crucial and are game changing for that. And we think that given the visibility that we have and, you know, the incredible kind of platform that we're building through TSX, we provide not only being at like the epicenter of the busiest intersection in North America with you know, the, the most innovative screen and billboard that, that I think exists in the world, given all the features and the things that you'll be seeing from that. Um, we have this really unique opportunity to onboard a whole new, I guess, generation of people to, to Web3, right? And we think if we do, like, personally, I look at it as my goal as chief metaverse officer here. If I do my job right, TSX will be the ones responsible for being the first time a lot of people have participated in, you know, an NFT or metaverse style experience from things happening. And, and by the way, they might not even know that it's, I think part of it is like, it doesn't, they don't even need to know that it's an NFT. That's just the, the token it's that it's technology, there. It's, it's a technology yeah, behind people it. don't talk about like what payment processing system when they swipe their visa on, right? Like, so I think we need to get away from that. And that's how we look at a lot of these projects. Like we need to create cool experiences and cool products that in like, if NFTs are the mechanisms that we distribute it, so be it. Um, but like the, the end user should just get great value and great experiences. And I think Nick will tell you like his whole vision for this project is all around like experience. Yeah. Let's, I want to, I want to get to that one second, but I, but now my, my wheels are turning here. And I think that's really the dynamic I, I, I think, and there's a narrative going on that NFTs have really been a lot of bad PR for web three. People are, are, are keeping those two close, uh, you know, the one and one it's the technology behind it. And we're all going to migrate to that way one way or another, whether you whether you like it or not, to the evolution of technology. And I truly think that music is a universal language, a universal gateway to experiences. Nick, with that being said, I love to hear the vision behind TSX and and, and this project because it's fascinating. And I, and I personally, I'm 45 minutes away from New York City. Can't wait to experience it live. Yeah, and I think to Ski's point as well. I mean, there was a lot of takeaway for me. I mean, I had I had the the, the luxury of sitting in the front seat for seven years. You know, uh, when when the music industry got transformed and Spotify become like the number one leader in that uh, in that industry, and and everything changed. But there was a lot of takeaways for me, you know, like because whatever we think about Spotify is still by core a very tech company driven, you know, like and and I think sometimes uh, maybe there are certain things being missed, even if I think the mission that Daniel has created is is fantastic, you know, like and what he want to do for creators. I think when what I realize is that we sometimes mixing up two different things. Uh, and first of all, like when we're looking at the world today in this attention economy, when everybody is even the biggest artists in the world struggle, you know, to really cut through the noise, it's getting more and more difficult to compete about that time. So when, when, and this, it's a funny story because like I actually, the reason I ended up doing this project was that after seven years of Spotify, I basically said like, I think we need to go way, way more offline because what I find out was that like artists, you can speak to artists and say like, hey, you got a billion streams 
And they think that's cool. But when you tell them, they're like, hey, and we're going to do this big takeover at Times Square with billboards, they freak out. They run down there and they take photos because there's like a culture currency, like that vanity that kind of disappeared when all the traditional media disappeared. And there's like people don't really understand that uh, the most of the creators and artists don't start with you know, acting, music, whatever they do, because they want to make money. They do it because they they want to tell the story. And in some way, like that storytelling got so decentralized, meaning that we consume all, all kind of content basically by ourselves on any device, you know, like, and these kind of gatherings, you know, like these big looks kind of disappeared. And we saw it very clear. So when I went down and had the first meeting around Times Square to really look at like, what is the equivalent to what Tower Records and MTV was Tower in the Records. world 2025, you know? So when I came down there and realized, you know, a little bit the fact that it's more people coming to Times Square every day than go to Lollapalooza, Coachella, and Super Bowl combined, and there's nothing going on, you know, like, and it just felt like these revolving door of people and the opportunity. And when I met the Fortress guys and they told me about, uh, the building, the TSX Broadway building and their vision, I just felt like this is what I've been waiting for. This is like the correlation between taking a physical building that has all that vanity value uh, and and share, you know, some of the thinking of the playbooks of almost like a Disneyland for music, Vegas, and try to make that happen. And then adding like the technology layer and make it like the combination of the perfect physical location and new technology. That was like the incentives of even getting into this. And to the point around when we're talking about Web3, uh, I think like sometimes we even refer our business to that that building that is so enormous, 2.8 billion, the, the most, one of the most expensive kind of construction ever happened in New York. That is the ticket for us to the entertainment industry. Because it's almost like a vanity Trojan horse that kind of gives us, you know, that that conversation with the industry to say, like, there's other ways to do it. I ran it a little bit there, but I think I needed to kind of encapsule, you know, like it's a full story. Things. Yeah. But well, you need to tell the full story. And thank you for sharing that. And some of the things that are coming going across my head is that like everyone thinks Web3 is is fully digital. They think metaverse, you know, this alt reality, this alt universe, but you guys are bringing it all together in the physical space, which I think is so important because so many people who are hesitant for Web3 are like, I, I get it. That's that's Sims from 15 years ago. I, I remember Sim City. Like I know how to play that shit, right? But this is like, how do you bring it all to life in the new experiences? And how do you tie in live entertainment? to the digital world, into ownership, into creating, and going from that creator economy to the ownership economy. The other key piece is storytelling. What are your thoughts? I'm going I'm to kind of throw out a left field here. I mean, think about an artist like Kanye West. Mm -hmm. Think about what The Weeknd is doing. Artists like this that are innovating and they're getting back to these ideas of concept albums instead of individual tracks, which, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the digital music evolution kind of went in that direction where artists were just doing one-off tracks versus the album. Like, think about The Wall. Think about Pink Floyd Animals. I mean, these are, you listen beginning to end, and they tell a story. Do you guys feel we're going to get back to some of that in, from the music side? I think we're getting more, like, segmented than ever, right? Like, Nick is the, Nick's at a front row seat, and actually looking at all the data and seeing what people are listening to and watching those trends evolve. So he probably has a much deeper insight from the, than, than this and can add on. But for me, I think that, like, there's going to be so many, like, different niches, and there's going to be some artists that are incredible, like, you know, artists that just you know creating albums and existing and different things there's gonna be some that are just single driven right like i think you're gonna see the spreads i think you're not gonna see any more it used to be like a one size fits all box and it's evolved a little from that that still exists somewhat but i think you're gonna see a lot more variety that especially when you, we look at like just some of the new technologies and ways that artists can can earn a living um but that being said i think that there will be you know i think there will be worldwide superstars always um, and they just need platforms. And that's what, you know, we're trying to do at TSX. Like today, there are a lot of the stars that are now like superstars. There's not a ton that, you know, if you look at back in the nineties or two thousands, right? Like everybody knew the biggest artists in the world today. You could go through like the biggest new artists and they're only known by a, a small fan base, right? Like even BTS for being so big, right? Like the, the most rapid following and everybody loves and listens to the music. If you were to ask the average person, right, like just off the street, if they knew that song, they probably wouldn't. They might have heard the group name or anything, but it's not like it used to be like everybody would have known, you know, the Beyonce and Jay-Z song or something, right? Like that's, that's what I've seen change.
The podcast is brought to you in partnership with Venturi, the recruitment operating system, the all-in-one tech platform purposely built for recruitment and staffing to unify your front, middle, and back office operations. Venturi is designed by recruiters for recruiters. Both the company and the platform are the unique creations of successful recruiters who sold their business, saw a need for a better recruitment tech, and made it happen. And if you're looking to upgrade your recruitment tech and give your recruiters a new modern operating system, visit venturi.io slash podcast. That's V-I-N-C-E-R-E dot I-O backslash P-O-Z-C-A-S-T for an exclusive offer. Thanks. The other really unique piece about Web3 is is community. And and I think a first step in community, in, and I'd love to get your take on this. How, Nick, how do you define community in the music world? Yeah, I think I want to go back and, and answer two other questions. Uh, so I think the first one is really when you're talking about like the format. And I think what we see is like it's it's all coming back to tools and, and the shift. But I think the in in the in the middle of all this, which I've seen the biggest change happening, is really the relationship between fans and artists. Uh, like the power of fans today is so huge, like they will hire you, but they will fire you as well. Like there's there's a completely different world we walk into. And we have like what we said from the beginning, which I think to your point around like what is the what is the new relationship if the, if the relationship in the old days was like an lp an album or something like that that was the exchange today like fans demand so much more so when people believe that like music is now a streaming service that's the end of it then when you see kanye you know like releasing the stand player or whatever they do like i just think that artists are not only thinking because i mean like Abel is also like an investor in these companies. We have a lot of superstars that are involved in TSX. So like, I know that all these creative artists are thinking outside the original craft. They want to take their brands. They want to create a different relationship with their fans and fans demanding more. So you just need to give them a brand new set, like a new toolkit on a lot of different ways to create experiences. I will not say... For the fans, I would say like with the fans. I think that is the collaboration changing happening new. It's a more immersive experience, fans demanding to be it. And I think I always come back to that quote we have talked about in the office. When I when I watch an old documentary on from MTV, there was like a momentum in that. There was like a momento moment, uh, point there for me when they say like, by mistake, they turn the cameras to the audience and everything changed. And, and for me, like, that's pop culture what it is today. It's totally shift. You know, like, if you look at any social media self, is the way, like, how fans immerse themselves with artists and vice versa is, I think this is just the beginning. We, I think fans will need to participate in the experience, you know, like, in a different ways. And I think artists is going to open up for bringing in fans in different ways to be creative, to create that, because that's the only way to really cut through the noise and amplify the message. So what we hope at TSX is really to create that new playground, not only for artists, but doing it together with fans and artists where they, for the first way, can immerse in a way that never happened before. And that cannot be just digital, you know. The the kind of cool thing that I'm getting as a, sideline reporter here is the excitement enthusiasm that you guys have when talking about this i mean you guys are creators i mean this is like every day just waking up with fire and executing and building and momentum and you guys are the pioneers of this and 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 it's pretty awesome to talk about i mean this is reality at scale right like we're bringing it to life but how are we going to be you guys as the shepherds of this making sure that we're really moving in the direction of collaboration versus falling back to some of, of, of the old faults that we have. I mean, for us, I think it's leveraging. That's the great thing about Web3. It's about decentralization and, in essence, empower the people and, and transparency and cutting out the, the middlemen. Like, we know very, and, and especially with what Nick said earlier, it was key about artists, right? Like, fans can not only make you, but break you, like, instantly. Like, they're, they're everything. And I think it's the same for anything. Like, you see businesses. If we don't make the right moves and if we don't stay on board, like, somebody else is going to come behind us and, and take our ideas and do it better and do it more, more fair. Like, I don't think there is that ability to monopolize things from, at least from the, the, the type of things that we're doing. Um, so we have to make those, those right decisions because at the end of the day, it's all about the people in the community and, and, and both artistic and consumer cre- cre- you know, communities, we have to do the right things. Like we're forced to, everything is, is transparent nowadays and, and you want to be on the right side of things.
Yeah, you know, radical radical transparency, Nick. Yeah, and there's another thing <clears throat> to think about. It's a little bit like how how conversations getting amplified today. I mean, like to be honest, like we used to live in a world where it was very editorial. You're like there was people with an opinion in different way expressing whatever they think about anything. It doesn't work like that today. It's like it's a lot of AI machine learning that feeds all these kind of different kind of or flows that people get our information from. So we also up against like a different kind of structure when it comes to like how to amplify content. And and I'm gonna tell you like one short story where I, I mean Please. like it was it was a while since I left Spotify, but you know, like when Spotify bought Tunigo and I came in, which was like Spotify didn't have any playlists before they acquired Tunigo, it was 2013. And together with an amazing team that I was able to hire, we created all these brands like Rap Caviar, New Music Friday, Viva Latino, and so on and so on. And I think everyone's looking at Spotify today, take for granted that there's playlists for anything and there's mm-hmm. all these big brands, but it didn't look like that because, and the point about what happens when you start to introduce that is really about a thing that people also forget about. Like in the old music industry, I always refer that only 25% of people bought records. Like 75% were listening to radio and, and you know, like experienced music in a different way because they felt it was almost like a little bit intrusive to go into these communities, you know, like. And I said to Daniel, when all these mainstreamers that used to listen to radio comes onto Spotify, they want to be guided. And the result of that, I'm coming to the point because this is what I think happened in the community is that, so by that, people know when they come in and they get these great recommendations, they usually press play. So there's no real in- interactions from the fans. So that means that today as an artist, if you get into that playlist structure, you know, like it's starting to be feed, you are in there for such a long period of time. Yeah, so like, if you're missing that moment when you release, it's very difficult to get in because no one is really taking the decision to skip songs or remove them. And to that point is that we're living in a world right now where a lot of the distribution mechanism is built around machine learning and AI. That also means what we think in a lot of at TSX is that how can we expand that moment when someone drops something to have a larger storytelling? How can we engage a lot of people in the shortest period of time, you know, like to get that input data? Because the machinery of the world today is really, it's not humans controlling that. So, so what I mean with that is that the competition is getting harder and that's what you're going to see artists is starting to add on more feature, more experiences and, and topping themselves mm-hmm. all the time because the competition get harder. I hope that makes sense, but it, it just can't change the whole, when people say like, we all have these tools and suddenly it's democratic at the same time, everybody's saying like, I don't have a clue how to break through that noise as a new person within the entertainment industry, mm-hmm. whatever. Right. But I mean, we think about the analogy. I mean, the, the playlist is having your music procured for you versus content curation on your own in your own journey. And I think that's really where it's starting to change to be an active participant in the creative and the music process. And of course, there are going to be people, you know, in the same way that that like to have their entertainment handed to them. And I've curated this for you. I've curated that playlist and it's going to be much more of a, of, of a choose your own adventure. So talking about the project specifically. What what has been ski? What has been a a roadblock for you guys, whether it be physically or in the metaverse, and something that you've got, got a, had like a real challenge trying to get past to take this to the next level and keep it moving forward in the in the speed and direction that you guys envision? Sure, I can talk holistically just about Please. kind of the metaverse in general. That I, I would say that's not even isolated to to the project of TSX, but even other projects that I'm doing, and and I think the whole space in general, and that's. That, you know, for all this talk about the metaverse and like, look, I, I know about it. I wrote <laughs> the, the, the handbook on it. Right. So and, and we've done these experiences. A lot of these we're still a long ways off and need technology to catch up. You still can't have, you know, more than performing well. There's not many great examples mainstream of like having more than 100 people in a room of having, you know, there's all these talks of all these new platforms and there's probably, you know, 100 100 plus new metaverse platforms that have emerged. Yet the only like metaverse style experiences that are populated today 
are like, and they're not even true like web three metaverses by the definition really is like Roblox and Fortnite. So we need yeah. to get, you know, I think those are great entries, but we're, we're still a ways off from like this, this future that we see. I think like AR is going to come quick, especially whenever Apple makes their announce their rumored announcements. Um, Facebook's obviously invested a ton into to VR in these sectors, um, but we're still like a, a ways off from this technology. And the other part is like, we need to figure out how to create meaningful events and experiences in these digital environments that are different. It's not just taking like video content, like what the TSX metaverse won't be is we're not going to just like videotape these massive, you know, the biggest artists in the world on stage and like pipe them into to a metaverse or a game like. We want people to interact and engage and like there's yeah. been great examples of it like what travis scott did in fortnite little nas x and roblox where that's cool stuff. kind of like a ride and you're on for the journey but like what's the next step of that can you like what, what keeps me up is like how do we create things where adam if you play keys right like you could join in the weekend say was performing with us how do you actually in your instance so you're not messing up everybody else's right but like how do you jump in and play keys and we take out that vocal and like you jump on stage and you have the ability to do that and these are things that are like possible and you know, definitely there in the metaverse, but we're still like early in technology and even just figuring out early like, days. what experiences consumers want. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Nick, talk a little bit about the physical side of the experience with TSX, the Times Square, you know, build out. I mean, what is that takeaway that you envision participants walking away from? What do you, what do you want them to feel? What do you want them to say to their friends and their family after experiencing it? Yeah, I think like we, we said pretty early that like we don't want to we are not a concert venue per se. Even if we have the first permanent state at Times Square, our experience needs to be different. We need to make an interactive kind of immersive experience with people uh, being at Times Square. And what we mean with that is that we have what 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 Ski mentioned before, like the largest kind of signage around Times Square. We had everything from massive billboards to like LED facades and stuff like that. What we're trying to do with technology is trying to understand like what is the future of these you know experiences where we think about like a performance at TSX it's not a traditional concert I always remember when I went to Epcot Center you know probably 25 years ago and there was like a 3D version with a Michael Jackson video which was mind-blowing at that time so when we're thinking about like what the future of experience is and how we can have with the crossroads of being able to do something where if you're at Times Square with your mobile phone experiencing this, it's one experience. But how can we take that experience and do like a second best version for someone that can't be there? But both of them needs to be different and should not be passive. What I mean with that is like, what are all, how we usually talk about it and can see it as a, as a negative world. I see it as a positive world. We're trying to gamify what, what performance it uh, used to be. What I mean with gamification is that like, how can you encourage to, to, to skis points there that someone that is at a concert can feel I'm participating. I get, you know, additional experience out from being active in that. And how is that also helping the artist with, you know, the amplification and creating a better experience? That is where we kind of, without going in to talk about the bespoke technology we actually built for that experience, but that is like the best way. And there is where the web free and all these new 5G related uh, technology is really make it possible. Uh, it's, it, I just want to end by saying it's the same thing. People forget about there was no Uber before 4G. And I think sometimes, you know, like when 5G has been in a conversation, uh, you know, for quite a long period of time, but it's not enough. It's not just about the fact that like it's a quicker speed. It's really about like having the service at the end, you know, like to well said. have that enormous data being transitioned in real time between different parties and that's that's what you're going to see happen. I, I thank you that's the tremendous insight and perspective there and something i just was thinking about i wasn't i don't even have it on my on my sheet here but how are you guys thinking holistically when we talk about inclusiveness and we talk about folks that are disabilities and neurodiversity i mean i think there's so many advantages to the web3 because there's other elements aside from your typical senses and how do you bring them together but where are you guys thinking and and if so like how are you guys thinking about how do we, how do we make this an inclusive experience for everybody and also folks that that aren't can't get to New York and don't have the means and ways to get there uh, globally. Yeah, I think like the, the number one thing is that we're trying to 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 we said you know like in a way that we wanted to 
We have the largest billboard ever built at Times Square. It's 18,000 square foot, you know, like, and we are the only one. In Delaware. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Made a Delaware up on that billboard. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane, but right? it's like, and the number one thing that is different is that we're not running commercials on it. So we Thank see God. that as like a gateway into entertainment. So if you imagine that you take a mobile phone and you make it as a companion app and you and you make it available with sound and you're starting to, to do that, you're going you're gonna to realize pretty quickly that you become way, way more inclusive. So what we're trying to understand is really where the intersection goes from like, what of these experiences can anyone be with like the speed meet and greets and stuff like that anyone can do it but they can also participate by actually being pixels on that star when there are these big performances you know like so we we're trying to look at all the different things where the interactivity happens you know everything from nft ticketing to meet and greets to different exclusive content go behind the scenes like how much of that thing can actually happen no matter where you are and that's what we're trying to solve you know like but we always look at it like being there physically, you know, really in the hospitality VIP things around the building or in front of Times Square, which is a different experience. Or if you are in Metaverse or sitting and, and watch this somewhere else with the interactivity, you're still going to get way, way more than the traditional that we want to stay away from. Like we don't believe broadcast is the way to go. There needs to be an element or interactivity. I, that's awesome. And, and where, where are we at in the timeline here? When is this thing launching? When, when are we going to be able to get there? When am I going to get on the train with my daughter and uh, experience this with her together? Side note, by the way, I have a 10 year old daughter and her and I are learning Web3 and NFTs together. And it's been the most incredible. We're bonding over it. We're both learning something both new mm -hmm. together at the same time. And she's creating her own NFTs. She's a TikTok creator. And, and it's really just an interesting way when you think about parenting and bonding and friendship. And I think that that's kind of what it's all about. So when is this thing coming to life? It's coming in phases. So the first phase that we haven't told, but we can tell you here is that we're going to open up the screen with a lot of never seen experiences before, even in November this year. So that's coming up quickly. And then we're going to face all these different things because it's like it has a retail component. It has an immersive experience component. It has a lot of, of you know, FMBs components is indoor venues the first supper club at broadway oh, so nice. when we're looking at all the different things because it's like 11 floors of entertainment plus you know a 660 room hotel uh, so you will see us face this out starting in november and i think during the upcoming 12 months you will see a lot of these things coming alive after november can't wait can't wait and i'm going to definitely stay in touch with you guys love to do a little podcast live happening over there. So I want to, I want to bring this home. Both of you are, uh, are very accomplished, uh, business, business folks in your, in your own right. And I love to, this is my masterclass. I reverse engineered that shit. I just bring on people that I want to learn from and I just have them on the podcast for an hour. I mean, this is fantastic. Um, let's start with, with, with you, Scott, what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every day? And Nick, I'm going to ask you the same question. So you got a couple of minutes to think about it. Yeah. Ooh, Great question. Wow. I've got to dig deep. I don't know if the single thing I'll tell you, you know, you know what I live by though. There's actually like, exactly words. like a mantra. Yeah. There's three words above me. Um, and it's patience, persistence, and perseverance, right? Like it's having the patience to, you know, which is always the most difficult part for me because I want everything instantly. Um, the ones that succeed in the end are the ones that persevere for, for all the accolades and accomplishments that myself or anybody has, you'll see, you know, way more stories of failure that you learn from that. And then I guess, you know, the, the, the perseverance is, and, and persistence is just, you know, you stay at it. And you, f you find a way to, to make it work. So I, I think, you know, that's, that's something that comes to mind, you know, very, uh, very quick for me. I literally have goosebumps when you say that because I always say posers three P's. I say patient, polite, persistence. That's kind of my take. I like, on I that. like polite too. I, it, I'll it, throw it, that it in there too. It's just kind of, and it's hard. And I put the reason I put polite in there is because I'm a snarky New Yorker and I have to be mindful when I'm talking to a lot of you guys deal with snarky New Yorkers all day long. Like, this is my true self, but sometimes it doesn't always resonate with everybody. Yeah. So I really just try to be mindful of my outward appearance uh, and, and the, way, the way I am in the universe. And the way I put myself out there. So I, I, I love it. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Nick, so, what about yourself? What's your, what, what's your mantra? What do you live by, man? Yeah. I, I think like my biggest learning is that, uh, don't, don't ever believe that you have all the answers and you know that your plan, this is how I'm going to execute on it. I, I, I think like by through 
I mean, I can tell you a hundred stories around Spotify that people believe it was planned. It was never planned, you know, like, and I think whatever I have done in my life, every time I believe I understand something, I fail. Uh, so when we started this project, we, we made it very clear when we brought in all the talented people to say, like, we don't have the answers. Like, that's why you're here. Like, we have like a macro view of what we believe is going to happen in the entertainment industry, where it's heading. Our job is, is really to learn by doing. And I, I, I think, you know, like, and everybody, I think every entrepreneur can say that, like, if you get the right people together, you know, like, you know that whatever your initial kind of strategy was, it's going to shift, but it's always going to be successful. It's all about execution. It's about like bringing smart people in a room and have an open mind when you develop, because when you want to change something, and especially like we do in here, a lot of people asking, you know, like, can you explain what you're doing? I say like, I can't do that because I'm sorry, no one has done it before, but we're trying really to, to do something spectacular. But I'm going to tell you as soon as we find out things and know a little bit more where it's going to heading. So, so my number one, I think if you have smart people, the reason why people, why, why they're serial entrepreneurs and why they're successful is because they live by that. They know that. You, you actually, if you are successful, like you go out and talk to angels or VCs, they're going to give you money even if you don't have a concept because they want to be involved when you're doing your next thing. And I think that is that is the setup to understand like it, it's not going to be the way you think about it. It doesn't matter what you do, your presentations and what you think, you're going to change them. And I have only seen like I've been working with is crazy enough since uh, you know, more than two years right now. And, and we have had this team around those for more than 10 months right now. And I think Ski can talk to it as well. Like every month, there's a sh there's like a little bit turn to your right or left. But I think every turn we're doing is just makes it so much clearer. You're starting to see the goal. I don't know if this makes sense, but it's like, I think you you should never fool yourself. Like if you have the privilege to work with talented people and you know what you want to change on the highest level, exactly how to do it, you're gonna find it, you're gonna find out, you know, like and and that's what makes what I wake up every morning is like that's the biggest excitement. I don't know what's gonna happen, you know. Yeah, I love I love it. And so normally when I wrap up a show with one person, I have my go-to question that I do every single show, but I'm gonna switch it up here a little bit. And I got one final question for each of you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it a little a little bit different here. So I'm gonna start with Scott um up top. Which music artist do you feel had the great has the greatest business acumen and why? And what have you learned from them? Um, it's tough to say anybody but Jay Z, given what he has accomplished. I guess. Well, you know what? I'll give it to Dre too, because Dre made a boatload of money. Like, if business is measured by success financially, those, those guys are at the top of the list. Dre for for always just being, you know, so detail oriented and focused and being able to build such a good product. And I remember like doing the first Beats by Dre. I actually have the first sample DJ headphones I ever made wow. from that. I mean, like data that. one. Yeah, it says the, oh. the, the beta sample. It's in like a marker. It's in like a Sharpie, <laughs> like Beats. And just watching his level of detail and how he's had such a long career. And then Jay, like for everything from expanding like beyond just music, right? And beyond just hip hop to becoming, you know, focal for sports, being one of the biggest sports agents and taking advantage of the platform that he built in this audience. Like he's, he's always been just a great person and like took advantage of, you know, the, the cool factor that he had and was able to flip it into a lot of different, different areas. But, you know, there, there's, there's many of them out there. I mean, so many artists or entrepreneurs at the, the core and they come up from that. Those two definitely stand out. I me. love it. Nick, you've, you've, the time has come. You've given it all up. You said, I'm done with this industry. I'm, I'm done with it anymore. And people don't know your real passion. Your real passion is writing those little fortunes inside the fortune cookies that you get from the from the Chinese restaurant. Now this is your job. What is the first fortune you write in that first cookie? Oh, I was hoping that I would get the same question as me. I mean, <laughs> I have a great answer for that. Can I'll, I you'll, I'll give you, you can totally answer it too, but I want to hear this one. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I got to be a little patriotic here, but I, I, I think I have a close friend uh, to me that I think is the most, one of the most, impressive carriers i ever seen in the industry and the reason i'm saying that and and that's max martin martin sandberg i just think like for a writer to be able to be first of all like having the most number one billboards uh, ever you know more than the beatles and whatever and be able to sustain that over a period 
of from the middle of of like 95 the first 95 96 the first one up till you know like almost 30 years later is for me unbelievable you're like that someone can produce on a talent and lead like new artists and i mean a lot of these artists that he's working with was barely not born when he did you know the britney on the backstreet boys or whatever was that in the early days to see how he transitioned over and i think that is artists very very few artists they whatever artists you take they're going to have a period you know even a jc where it was like he was that was the period you know like they're going to keep releasing but it's going to be very difficult to stand up so i think being consistent and adopting you know like you know all these things is is a quality that is is incredible i love it you know and and i to the fortune cookies um i i have actually a fortune cookie that i got you know like 30 years ago that keeps in my pocket that actually say uh, your genuine talent will find its way to success. So for me, it's like I always carry that with me. And it was interesting because I, I picked it up, you know, especially, you know, after all the disasters and roller coaster until we were able to sell Tunigo when all the investors said they're not going to put any more money into it. You know, all the all the typical ones and then Spotify buy it. And every investor says, like, I always believe in you, which is a, is, is a lie. <laughs> So, so at these moments, like I always look at that and say, like, okay, you have to realize that it's you are the only one that can make these changes. No one else is going to be the ones who pushing you there. Right. So I, I think that is 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 key. It's almost like I I knew you had that fortune that you kept with you, and I planned that question in advance. But 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 I I mean that that's crazy, gentlemen. This has been a fantastic conversation. I greatly appreciate both of you taking the time to join me today. Glad we worked through the technical because there's always a solution to every problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's one of my uh, one of my mantras here. I want everyone to check out uh, TSX on all the social media. Please follow along. Take keep an eye out for the launch. The phase launch is going to be incredible. This is the evolution. This is the revolution. And these guys are leading the way. And I'm thrilled that I had the time to speak to them. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining with me. Hang with me for one moment here as I sign off. Everybody listening, if you found value in this show, please share it goes a long way, lead a rating review. You know where to find out more at thepodcast.com. Follow us on those social media channels. Remember, take care of each other, look out for one another, and catch us next week for another great episode of The podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The Pausecast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com. <laughs>